In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to you, O Lord, glory to you. O heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, who are everywhere present and fill all things, treasury of good things and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from every impurity and save our souls, O good one. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. I believe in one God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten, begotten of the Father before all worlds, light of light, true God of true God, begotten not created, of one essence with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man and was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate, and suffered and was buried on the third day, he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who together with the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, I confess one baptism for the remission of sins, I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Welcome to the Orthologio Orthodox Apologetics channel. I am your host, Skylar. So, as I said in our previous video that we did, we're going to be starting a new video series on the Twelve Prophets, going through St. Cyril of Alexandria and his commentary on the Twelve Prophets, Volumes 1, 2, and 3. Uh, this video, we're going to look at Joel, Nahum, and Jonah. And our first video was on Obadiah, Obadiah, Haggai, and Malachi, right? If you didn't check out that video, uh, you can, you're more than welcome to check out part one of this series, but it's not like our situation on, in previous videos, right? Like our brief series on Jay Warner Wallace, Person of Interest, where it was like two halves of the books, like... Uh, the videos are focusing on three separate prophets, so there's not going to be too much overlap between them, but there's going to be uh, pointing to things that which happen in the New Testament and the person of Jesus Christ in these Old Testament prophetic books. Uh, also, as a friendly reminder, I created a blog, uh, patri patristicswithjohn.wordpress.com. You can feel free to check out my blog. I have some posts, uh, Zephaniah and St. Cyril Alexandria, which we have not addressed in a video yet, but I may do so in a future video. There is also a post on the name of Jesus, another two commentary pieces based on St. Cyril Alexandria regarding Obadiah and Haggai. Uh, a little similar material-wise to the video, if you would like more info on Obadiah and Haggai, you can read the accompanying blog post on my blog site. And then finally, there is a piece on the divinity of Christ in light of John 5, 18 to 23. Uh, this is a discourse given by Jesus following the healing of the paralytic man at the Pool of Bethesda. We see that this is a parable that's found in some of the other Gospels, such as Mark and Mark 2. We also see all the healing of the paralytic man. But the actual discourse explanation, if you will, of Jesus Christ following this miracle, which was performed on the Sabbath, is found in John. And the reason Jesus gives for why he did this is, look, I'm God by nature. And there's a little bit more information, like it's more... I don't, I don't really want to say direct, in a sense, in John, because people like to say John is higher Christology. When you look at the account in Mark, it still shows that Jesus is God, even though it doesn't necessarily contain the same dialogue response given by Jesus to the Jewish rabbis and religious leaders. But ultimately, as we're going to see, there's the Trinity in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. It was believed in by the Old Testament Church and the New Testament Church. The Anti-Nicene Fathers write about the Trinity and the Divinity, our blessed and glorious Savior, Jesus Christ. 
And I, I guess all this information that I like to read about and research and write about, I am going to be compiling into a book centered on the Trinity before Nicaea. Uh, right now, this book is in its early stages. I'm working on an uh, introduction, beginning chapters, uh, table of contents, uh, potential appendixes to have at the end of the book that not necessarily deal with the book proper. I guess right now my game plan would be to focus on uh, exegesis of the Church Fathers and the Patristic Testimony and the Ancient Jewish Sources, right? And all the secondary literature we have from people like Alan Siegel, Peter Schaefer, and so on and so forth, right? And just analyze and present all this information that we have available to us in an orthodox perspective. Like the orthodox perspective, if you will, on all this information, how we make sense of it, how we show that the Trinity is historically rooted in the Old Testament church, which developed in the Second Temple era of the Old Testament, that it's found in the early church and the earliest followers of Jesus Christ, as we see in Father Stephen DeYoung's book, uh, The Religion of the, of the Apostles, Orthodox Christianity in the First Century, another great book that you can check out and read. Uh, not necessarily uh, filled with scholarly references, but it's not necessarily an academic book, it's more a reader, if you will, and it's beneficial, good information you can glean from it, and that is a book that I would recommend, but uh, that's enough tangents for now, we're going to jump into our analysis of Joel, Nahum, and Jonah. So we are going to start with Joel. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to place the prophet Joel chronologically speaking. So Joel was most likely a contemporary of Hosea and Amos, which means he's in the 8th century BC. If you want more specificity, uh, they kind of calculate this by the Hebrew text, the Antioch text as well, which actually ordered the 12 prophets chronologically unlike the Septuagint, which listed the first six books of, that is, of the Twelve Prophets by length. So, right, so this is where St. Cyril and the translator Robert C. Hill is getting this information from, is it's found in a footnote. And uh, as for the content, uh, St. Cyril contends that the Blessed Prophet Joel wants to chastise Israel and recount the previous punishments in order to bring about a change in their condition. In other words, the goal is for Israel to return to God and live God-centered lives. We're also going to see verses about the Incarnation, Pentecost, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the Second Coming, and more. Ultimately, what I want you to take away from this is that Joel matters, and it is worthy to be read and studied. So let us jump into Joel chapter 1. So we see this phrase in the opening verse of Joel 1.1, 1, 1, the translation up on your screen is St. Cyril's, and it says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Bethuel, in the LXX, uh, Bethuel is spelled with a P. Uh, that shouldn't really be a concern to us, like... It's the same name, it's the same person. But the significance of such a verse lies first in its indication of Joel as a legitimate prophet in light of the Old Testament by his having met the word of the Lord. In other words, Joel is a true prophet and worthy to be followed. The words of which he writes are inspired by the Holy Spirit, and thus what is prophesied of by Joel will come to pass exactly as it is written. Joel is shown the future things by the Holy Spirit, and what he is writing about is as if it happened before the very eyes of Joel. Now, the verse in particular says, came to Joel, son of Bethuel. So, why mention this name? So, for St. Cyril, he argues that Joel may have been a common name at this time in the 8th century BC, right? 8th, 9th century BC, uh, there were probably multiple people named Joel. So, by giving his father, it shows that we're talking about a specific Joel and this uh, identifies him more specifically. And so that's his response to it. As we go on, we see in verses two to four, 
Uh, the sacred text meant that there resulted lack of produce from the fields, shortage of crops, and frequently extreme and lengthy famine throughout the land of the Jews. This is a quote, right? So when we read Joel, we see that we, what I said in the background, right, it's calling these calamities that are going to befall Israel, like these bad things are going to happen, not necessarily warfare, but drought, famine, all these things, and we have this prophecy about locusts, and the locusts, if you will, could be referring to invasions that happened to the kingdom of Israel and Judah, right? They were attacked by Shishak, king of Egypt, Hazel the Syrian, Paul and Paul, king of Babylon, among others during this time period, right? The Warfare was a recurrent theme in the Old Testament prophetic context. Israel was not necessarily at peace with their neighbors at all times, and there was uh, a constant threat that they could be attacked by their neighbors. Sometimes the neighboring people, like uh, the Babylonians, right, the Assyrians, they get are victorious over Israel because of sins of Israel as a punishment to them, and they are led into captivity, and that is what some of these of the 12 prophets are going to talk about, right? They're going to be talking about the Babylonian captivity. We saw that in Haggai, where Haggai is actually being written in, what is it, uh, 520 BC, roughly, and it's talking about Israel is returning from the lands of the Persian and Medes. I mean, the Persians and Medes is just like a broader geographic reference, if you will. Like, it includes the territory of Babylon, right? So when they have Nebuchadnezzar come and the Babylonian captivity, and then Cyrus the Great is victorious, his son Darius becomes king, and that's when Haggai is written, and they return to Jerusalem and Israel, and they re-inhabit it, and they begin to reconstruct the temple. You also have elsewhere in the Old Testament, right? Uh, going back to Israel again, and Jerusalem, rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the wall. I mean, this is a... Uh, uh, it happens uh, quite a few times where the temple gets destroyed, they get sent in captivity, and right, they're being sent prophets, and many of these prophets came at the same time. So the 12 minor prophets, if you will, are between, say, 800 BC and 520 BC is like roughly when they're all sent, that time span, chronologically speaking. But that's enough. We're going to go on to Joel chapter 2. So we read in verses 1 to 2, this is the translation of St. Cyril, Sound a trumpet in Zion, proclaim in my holy mountain, and all the inhabitants of the earth will assemble. For the day of the Lord has come, because a day of darkness and gloom is nigh, a day of cloud and mist. So what we have here is the plague of locusts. This is the prophetic motif that we see in Joel chapter 1. It's going to continue in Joel chapter 2. And the plague of locusts, whether it's referring to Babylon or Assyria, or Assyria uh, St. Cyril contends that it either one works for us. It's nonetheless an apop apocalyptic motif that is continued from chapter 1, and in particular we see that it fits, right? The Assyrians, as uh, modern historians will affirm to you, were notoriously violent in warfare, and that's made clear by the beginning verses of Joel 2. A day of darkness and gloom is nigh, a day of cloud and mist, right? You do not want to lose a battle with Assyria. They're particularly violent. They're particularly brutal. Uh, their methods uh, would most likely be condemned by modern uh, standards of ethical warfare and rules for warfare. We see this, uh, I mean, this is actually addressed by me in our video on the problem of violence in the Old Testament, where we discussed God is a man of war, the problem of violence in the Old Testament by Father Stephen de Young. Uh, basically, the Assyrians were just notoriously violent. We see that in these opening verses for Joel 2, 2 1 to 2. It's continually the apocalyptic motif of the locusts. But here is what we see, and this is going to be one of the important parts of chapter 2. We see that there's a day of 
darkness and gloom is nigh, right? So this is going to be a troubling time. It's going to cause weeping and lamenting. But look what the Lord our God says. Turn back to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with lamenting. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Turn back to the Lord your God, because he is merciful and compassionate, long-suffering and rich in mercy and repenting of the troubles. Who knows if he will turn and repent and leave behind him a blessing, a sacrifice, and a drink offering to the Lord your God. In other words, Joel is trying to reassure the people of Israel. Like, he's telling them, like, look, Assyria is going to come. It's going to be violent. It's going to be bad. You're going to lose the battle. You're not going to win this fight. God has ordained that you're going to lose. That is his will in this particular case, our particular circumstances here. But if you stay loyal to the Lord or God, if you stay loyal to the God of Israel, if you turn to him with all your heart, you fast, uh, you turn to him in prayer and repentance, and you worship him, and you do not turn to idolatry, paganism, polytheism like the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Hittites and the Egyptians and all these other peoples did, but you worship the Lord your God alone, he is going to bless you. And you're going to be restored. And so in the wake of hardship and calamity, this is actually a promise that God's going to ultimately restore justice to his chosen people. Eventually, the porch and the altar we see in the ending of chapter 2 are going to be united because Christ is the Lamb of God and our atoning sacrifice, as well as our high priest who brings us into perfect communion with the Father. In other words, uh, that which belongs to the people, is going to come into contact with the altar, right? The laity come into contact with the high priest. There is union, if you will. Christ, as our mediator, as our high priest, unites us with, their fa with the Father. That's what's going on here. That's the point of this metaphor in the, this particular verse I found at the end of chapter 2. And we see this in particular in Hebrews. We see this in Hebrews 7, 26 to 28, and elsewhere in this Pauline epistle. But uh, yeah, basically Christ is our high priest. He is also the Lamb of God who is our atoning sacrifices. And so the porch and the altar are united through the person of Jesus Christ. Now, as for the rest of chapter 2, there are also some other important verses I wanted to highlight. So, in verse 27, again, this is the translation of St. Cyril, we read, Let my people never be ashamed. You will know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is none besides me. My people in the future will never be ashamed. Right, this is speaking about the Incarnation, first and foremost. We see that Christ emptied himself and was found in the likeness of man. He was born of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And scripture also says in the New Testament, Romans 10.11, a quotation from the Psalms, Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. It's applying this verse of the psalm. The psalmist was David, I believe, in this particular psalm. But it applies this verse to the person of Jesus Christ. And it's saying, look, in the same verse we see in Joel 2.27, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Right? Indeed, the harvest is going to be reaped. Christ is is the harvester. The harvest is going to become plentiful, as the prior verses say, and lo, all who hope in the Lord will never be ashamed. Right? We see this motif of the harvest. Uh, we also see this in some of the other 12 prophets. But basically, it's saying how the harvest of Israel is going to wither, in a sense. And there's going to be a time when there's famine, there's drought, the fig trees are withering, the trees are not bearing fruit. But remain faithful to the Lord, do not become ashamed, because I am the Lord your God. I am in the midst of Israel. Indeed, Christ came to earth. He is Jehovah God in the flesh. He took on human likeness and was born of the Virgin Mary, the blessed Theotokos. He came and dwelt among us in the, in the flesh, preaching first to the house of Israel, but the very same gospel which he preached to the Israelites, his disciples later turned to it and spoke to the Gentiles the very same message. We also see there is encounters with the Samaritans 
and the Canaanites in the gospel, he does not speak only to the house of Israel. In particular, he speaks to everybody. His message is universal. We also see, as we're going to mention later on, this is also a reference to Ezekiel 3, 4 to 7, where the father is speaking, son of man, son of man, right? This is a messianic title, a divine title of divine implications for Jesus Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah, the Lord God Almighty is his name, as we read in Amos 4, 12 to 13. And yeah, basically, this is just a really important verse. I, I've kind of spoken a lot about it, so I'm going to move on to verses 28 to 29. After this, I shall pour out some of my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your elders will dream dreams, and your young people will see visions. On my men slaves and my women slaves, in those days I shall pour out some of my spirit. This is Joel 2, 28 to 29. So we see verse 27, we're talking about the incarnation. And this proves that, a verse that proves that Jesus Christ is Jehovah God in the flesh, mind you. And an application of not only Joel 2, 27, but of the Psalms as well, to Jesus Christ in the New Testament in Romans 10, 11, and elsewhere in Acts, such as Acts 4, 12, we see that Jesus Christ is Jehovah God in the flesh. We also see that this particular verse, 28 to 29, is talking about Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which again proves the divinity of Christ, for the verse clearly says, God will pour out the Holy Spirit, and lo, the Savior says, whom the Father will send in my name, in John chapter 14, verse 26. Indeed, we are not left as orphans, and Christ restores us to the way we were always meant to be. In verses 30 to 31, we see that this could be speaking of the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ, I'm sorry, or it could also be indicative of the crucifixion and how the veil of the temple was torn in two, the earthquake and the darkness over the land, right? We see the signs of the sun, moon, and stars of the earth, right? We see these uh, celestial and terrestrial events surrounding the crucifixion of Jesus Christ that we see in the Gospel of Matthew. And so it could be referring to that, or it could also be talking about the second coming of Christ, Either one, sometimes there is a double or even a triple meaning in the writings of the Old Testament prophets, right? That is always important to keep in mind. It's not necessarily always going to be an immediate or short ah, short-term fulfillment, right? I'm sorry about that. Tongue twister. My tongue got caught for a second. Basically, sometimes the Old Testament is speaking of things to come in the New Testament and even later on, such as the Day of Judgment, the Last Judgment, the Second Coming, which will enter us into the end times, right? So it would have an eschatological meaning to it. Now, verse 32, as we saw, my people in the future will never be ashamed. In 2.27, we see this also brought back up again in verse 32, which ends the chapter. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be a slave will be saved. This is applied to Jesus Christ in the New Testament, such as Acts 4.12. We also saw it in Romans 10.11, earlier on the slide here. And of course, it is expected that those who call on the name of the Lord, for Christ has the divine name itself. This is clearly articulated to us in the Old Testament prophetic context, the law, as well as the writings of the New Testament. I mean, look, this point is irrefutable evidence. Christ literally has the divine name itself, so he is God. Is that the only reason why we say Christ is God? No, but it sure is one of the reasons why we say that Christ is God. I mean, the divinity of Christ is a no-brainer, right? You have to believe in the Trinity and the divinity of our blessed and glorious Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, what do we see in Joel chapter 2? Right on the previous slide, we see it uh, a prayer of endurance, of continuity, that you continue to serve the Lord in the wake of hardship and calamity. And then at the end, we see incarnation, Pentecost, second coming of Christ, or signs which are indicative of the crucifixion from the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew account. And then verse 32, we see a point of judgment, and that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, which again shows the divinity of Jesus Christ in light of the New Testament application of Old Testament texts to the Messiah. 
And that is what we have for chapter two. We're going to say some words on Joel chapter three. So, because lo, in those days and at that time, when I shall cancel the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I shall gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my inheritance, Israel, who were scattered among the nations. They divided my land, cast lots for my people, gave the boys to prostitutes, sold the girls for wine, and drank it. Joel chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, St. Cyril's translation. So this prophecy on one hand can be referring to the restoration of Judah from the exile on, from the exile in Babylon and Assyria, right? We saw that in Joel chapter 1 and Joel chapter 2. It's speaking of locusts, this apocalyptic motif, if you will. There is going to be locusts, Babylon and Assyria that are going to come defeat Israel in, Bab in battle, lead them into captivity. But uh, eventually... Judah is going to be restored. It can also be speaking of the spiritual restoration of Christ, who frees us from sin and bondage and allows us to be indwelt with the Holy Spirit and come into perfect communion with the Father. We saw this on our first slide of Joel chapter 2, the unification of the porch and the altar theme that we see. Uh, I believe this is between verses 15 and 19 of Joel chapter 2 in the LXX. Uh, I could double check it. Uh, I'm not, I believe that's the specific reference for the porch and the altar. Uh, going further with the chapter in Joel chapter 3, Christ is also said to take as captives those bought from the pagan, brought from the pagan deceit to the acknowledgement of the one who is God by nature, Psalm 68, 18, right? We go from the uh, bondage of sin and death from the cloak of pagan deceit to the acknowledgement of the one who is God by nature and in truth. In verses 9 to 12, I shall sit in judgment on everyone in the valley of Jehoshaphat, meaning, of course, that Christ is the sole judge appointed and approved by the Father for all who oppose the church of Christ will be brought to shame. Uh, the rest of the chapter is speaking of the heavenly Jerusalem and the fate of the church. We see an eschatological meaning to this chapter in Joel chapter 3. Uh, just one final word. Christ is the sole judge appointed and approved by the Father. Right? We are not judged by a man nor through a man, but by the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ himself, who is in truth and by nature God, in, who became man for our salvation. And that's going to wrap up what I have to comment to you on the book of Joel from the Old Testament. Uh, the second prophetic book of the Old Testament we're going to be discussing from the Minor Prophets is Nahum. So Nahum is writing to show that Israel, which has been reduced to ruin and brought to shame for its sins, will in due time be restored because of the mercy, grace, and power of the Lord God Almighty. So remember, Israel was defeated and led into exile in the lands of the Persians and Medes. Nahum also predicts the fall of Nineveh. So chronologically speaking, Nahum is a contemporary of Zephaniah, Jeremiah, and Habakkuk. And his book was most likely written in the 7th, 7th century BC, but before 612 BC, which is the year that Nineveh fell, right? I mean, if Nahum is predicting the fall of Nineveh, it clearly had to be written before Nineveh was conquered and fell, right? Unless you want to get into the mental gymnastics of some liberal scholars who try and give later dates to the Old Testament prophetic books because their prophecies are just too accurate and thinking they're written after the fact. No, the God of Israel is omniscient. He knows the future. His prophets are inspired by the Holy Spirit. They write of the future things as if what they are writing is happening before their very eyes. This is what we see in the Old Testament prophets. They are inspired and sent by the one true God. And therefore, it is not surprising God is omniscient. He knows the future. What he wills will come to pass. What his prophets have written will come to pass exactly as it has been written by them. And so we can trust and follow the prophets of God. 
And that's the important thing to take away from the background to the book of Nahum. And we're going to say some words on Nahum chapter 1 to start off. So verse 1 of chapter 1 reads, An oracle for Nineveh, a book of a vision of Nahum of Elkosh. So Nahum, as we said previously, is predicting the fall of Nineveh, which means it's going to be written sometime before 612 BC. Uh, the Orthodox Study Bible gives you a date range of somewhere between like 663 BC at the earliest. I mean, that very well could be the case. We don't know for sure, though. It, we just know it was written sometime in the 7th century BC, but before 612 BC when uh, Nineveh fell, so I can't really give you an exact date for when this particular book was written. And Jerome, uh, he's of the opinion, right, the translator of the Vulgate, that Elkosh is the name of Nahum's father. Uh, St. Cyril of Alexandria disagrees with Jerome. Uh, he contends that it is the town from which Nahum originated, the exact location is unclear, but uh, there are people who would place Elkosh in Galilee. And basically, for St. Cyril of Alexandria, the impending prophecy is not directed solely at Nineveh, but it can also be directed at the Jews who abandon their love for God and practice polytheism during the captivity reminding us that there is a consequence for our actions, and if we do not live according to the commands of God, there will come a day when we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and brought to shame and ruin for our unjust actions. We will all be held accountable at some day for what we have done. That is the beauty of our religion, of the faith that we have in Jesus Christ, because we can trust in divine justice and the divine judge himself. We also read in uh, towards the end of chapter 1 verse 15 because lo swift on the mountains are the feet of the one bringing good news and announcing peace uh you can interpret this verse in a couple ways so in light of isaiah 45 1 to 2 and verse 13 you can say this is speaking of cyrus defeating nineveh and restoring the israelites to jerusalem right good news Cyrus defeated Nineveh, you're free to go back to Jerusalem. Cyrus himself, right, 539 BC, gives uh, the edict that Israel can return to Jerusalem. That's what we saw in the book of Haggai. On the other hand, this can also be speaking of John the Baptist, who lived in the wilderness and cried aloud on the mountains and brought the good news of the Messiah. So it can be speaking of Cyrus in light of what Isaiah writes in the Old Testament, or it can also be a verse in light of the New Testament speaking about John the Baptist. Uh, either one is works for St. Cyril of Alexandria, because remember, there is not necessarily one and only one meaning for a particular verse. Sometimes it can have a meaning both in the context of the Old Testament and also a second meaning in light of the New Testament, right? As we see in the Old Testament prophetic books, it's speaking about things that are going to happen and come about in the New Testament and even later on in terms of eschatologically speaking, such as the end times, like the second coming of Christ, which we saw in Joel chapter 2. But that's enough. We're going to proceed to Nahum chapter 2. So it is finished. It is gone. One has come up blowing in your face, rescuing you from tribulation. Right? So Nineveh, despite being a mighty city, will fall because the Lord willed it. That is what is meant by it is finished. It is gone. Nineveh has been defeated. Right? Cyrus pounces on Nineveh like a lion, as Jeremiah 4, 7 tells us. He returned the Israelites to Jerusalem and ordered them to rebuild the temple. This is what we see in Haggai. And in verse 12, we see this uh, question, where is the lion stead and the pasture meant for the cubs? Uh, for St. Cyril, uh, this is basically a mockery of Nineveh, like Idomea which we saw in the book of Obadiah. In other words, it does not matter what Nineveh does. It doesn't matter about its reputation, right? When the Lord decrees that Nineveh is going to be destroyed, it's going to happen regardless of what men say. 
right? The Lord is omnipotent. The Lord is omniscient. When the Lord decrees something, it's going to happen. Because what the Lord wills happens. When he chooses to do something, it happens as he said it would. And that is the important thing to keep in mind. And we will proceed to Nahum chapter 3. Lo, I am against you, says the Lord God Almighty. I shall uncover your rear to your face, and show nations your shame and kingdoms your dishonor. I shall cast loathing upon you and your uncleanliness, and make an example of you. This is uh, verses 5 to 6. We're skipping a little bit ahead here. The translation, again, of course, from St. Cyril of Alexandria. So this is what he comments. On the one hand, Nineveh seemed somewhat charming and desirable when puffed up with the artistry of soothsayers, very strong, invincible, and overwhelming compared with anyone else. When captured and falling, on the other hand, she was shown to be angry, ugly, and vile to those who knew her. In a similar way, the former Israel will be brought to shame and ruin for rejecting Jesus Christ and his church that the church, of course, will become the new Israel. There is life only with the only begotten. The sin and judgment reaches to the heaven reaches to heaven because they provoked not a mere prophet, but the Lord of the saints. They provoked God himself. They crucified the Lord himself. This is what Jeremiah 51 9 reads us tells us. And so there's salvation only with Christ. The kingdoms of this earth will always rise and fall, but the kingdom of heaven will have no end, and Christ will reign victorious both now and forevermore and unto ages of ages. Mighty Nineveh has fallen. Like it too, Babylon will fall, and so will Rome, and all the other giants of this present age will fall, but the kingdom of the Lord will endure forever, for the Lord is jealous for Zion, and he will establish his kingdom on earth, and it will reign forevermore. That is the promise of the heavenly Jerusalem. And so that concludes our comments on the book of Nahum. We are going to turn to Jonah. So while we started with Joel and Nahum, uh, the book of Jonah is actually written before Nahum. Jonah is a contemporary of Hosea, Amos, and Micah in the 8th century BC. So Nahum was written in the 7th century BC. Jonah is going to be written in the 8th century BC. Uh, if you want the reason why this is said, why St. Cyril is saying this, we uh, look at 2 Kings 14.25, which mentions Jonah, son of Amittai, during the reign of Jeroboam II. Uh, for St. Cyril, he concludes that this is the same Jonah uh, of that which bears the name of the prophetic book. So Jonah is sent to warn Nineveh of their impending destruction because of their repentance. And because of their repentance, the Lord does not destroy Nahum during the time of Jonah. However, Nahum, who comes uh, maybe 80 or so years after Jonah, predicts the, the destruction of Nineveh, and Nineveh will fall in 612 BC. There is also a parallel to the Gospel with Jonah. We see the Savior himself say, an evil and adulterous generation as for a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the signs of the prophet Jonah, just as Jonah was in the belly of the sea monster for three days and three nights. Likewise, the Son of Man will also be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Matthew 12, 39 to 40, the translation, of course, from St. Cyril. So thus, the person of Christ is foreshadowed by Jonah, and we'll explain why this is the case in our discussion of, jo of the book of Jonah. But before we get into that, I just want to add this disclaimer, right? So when we say Jonah is a typology of Christ, we don't mean that this is literally an exact representation, that everything from the life of Jonah is going to be applicable to the person of Jesus Christ. I mean, look, for starters, we can see this. Jonah was hesitant and tried to flee from his duty when Christ accepted his mission in full. But nonetheless, there are similarities between Jonah and Jesus Christ, and we can say that Jonah is a typology of Christ, spiritually speaking, for St. Cyril of Alexandria, and we're going to be explaining why in the coming exegesis of the following chapters of Jonah. 
So Jonah chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Rise up, go to the great city of Nineveh, and preach in it, because a clamor has ascended to me from their wickedness. Right, as we've seen before with some of the other Niner prophets, uh, Jonah is a legitimate prophet because he was sent by the word. But more than that, look at what we see. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, and we see him issuing a command. He's speaking in the first person as if he is God, because he is God. He says, rise up, go to the great city of Nineveh, and preach in it. It does not say, the Lord tells you, Jonah, son of Amittai, you must rise up, go to the great city of Nineveh, and preach in it. No, the word of the Lord is speaking in the first person as if he is God, because he is God. Uh, and a created angelic messenger is not allowed to do this. He can't use uh, first person pronouns and speak as if he is God when he is a mere creature. This shows that the word of the Lord is God and consubstantial to the Father. Uh, again, we see what I bolded here, because the clamor has ascended to me from their wickedness. The word of the Lord is speaking in the first person. And that shows that the word of the Lord is God. And so we see that God is angry at the perverse wickedness of Nineveh. Uh, so basically they transgressed God and their idolatry and impious actions, right? They have, as St. Cyril says, they have a multitude of shrines, altars, and temples to the innumerable demons that they worship. Right? I think I've mentioned this before, Psalm 96.5, the gods of the pagan nations are real, they're just demons, right? If you're not worshipping the god of Israel, the one true god, you're worshipping a demon. Okay, so these uh, gods like Baal, Baal of Peor, Malik, Dagon, etc., etc., right? These are demonic demons beings. They are demons that are being worshipped, and they're shrines to the demons, and this angers the Lord God Almighty, and he wants to render judgment against them. But in his infinite mercy and compassion, the Lord has decided to gen send Jonah as a warner and messenger to relay the fate of Nineveh to them. And we see that Jonah is a little hesitant about this. He doesn't exactly want to go to Nineveh, even though God told him to do told him that he must do that. So what Jonah does is he boards a ship for Tarshish. Uh, this could be a city in the coastal region of Palestine, but a great storm arises when he's on the ship. Uh, he's sleeping in the hull of the ship, in the sleeping quarters, and Jonah professes that he's a prophet of Yahweh, and the sailors immediately recognize something. They know Jonah is a Jew, He's journeying to a pagan land with pagans. The sailors know they're Gentiles. Why is a Jewish person on our ship? They know that's impermissible for a Jew. And they immediately conclude, Oh, snap, man. The storm is happening because of Jonah. It's all his fault. So they ask him, Why did you do this to us? Why did you bring about this storm? And so... Uh they offer prayers and sacrifices to the God of Israel, but the storm relents when they cast Jonah into the sea and he gets followed by a sea monster. And we see this verse from Psalm 89, 9, that's going to have a relay to what happens in the gospel. So in Psalm 89, 9, we read, you have control of the power of the sea, and you still the raging of its waves. Right? So, the Lord God Almighty has control over the seas, not Poseidon or some other demon, as pagans claim. And lo, in the New Testament, the Savior was asleep, journeying with his disciples in the Sea of Tiberias. And a strong wind came about, and the waves caused the disciples to fear. And lo, the Lord simply says, Peace, be still, and the storm is calm. Indeed, Christ is God by nature. He is he who can calm the seas and the winds, and they hearken to his command. They, for the wor words of the Lord are a fiery flame. They are like a hammer that smashes rocks, as Blessed Jeremiah tells us. Christ is God by nature. He calms the seas because he is God. Jonah was cast into the sea, and, that, and then God abated the storm. 
Christ, because he is God, simply commanded the winds and the waves and the storms stopped. That's a big difference. That's a key difference. And it shows that Jesus Christ is God. We also see Jesus says another comment elsewhere in the New Testament. Men of Nineveh will rise up at the, judge, at the judgment with this generation, condemn it because they re repented at the preaching of Jonah. And lo, greater, a greater than Jonah is here, Matthew 12, 41. So Jonah was telling Nineveh of their impending destruction, but Christ is going to judge the whole world, not just Israel. And therefore the Israelites are foolish to reject Christ because he is greater than Jonah on account of his being God by nature. Right? In other words, you're not just rejecting a prophet of God, you're literally rejecting God himself. That's the point that's being made here in Matthew 12, 41. And we're going to see there's other parallels with the book of Jonah and Christ and why Jonah is a typology for Christ. In uh, Jonah chapter 2, we see Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the sea monster, saying, I cried aloud in my distress to the Lord my God, and he hearkened to me from the belly of Hades. You heard the sound of my cry. Jonah 2, 1 to 2, Saint Cyril. So basically, Jonah has been swallowed by the sea monster and is praying to God. And as we read in his prayer in chapter 2, we're going to see that Jonah is distressed. He is remorseful for his fleeing God's commands. He imagines that he has been died and been delivered to Hades, but St. Cyril argues that Jonah was alive in the sea monster praying, which we see in verse 7, may my life rise up from corruption towards you, O Lord my God. Uh, either way, Jonah was exposed to hardship and extreme danger and believed he would die unless the Lord showed him mercy, and so he prays that he will serve the Lord, that he will serve the Lord shall he live. Like, he's repented, he's saying, look God, I'm not going to run away again. Like, if you let me live, if you take me out of this sea monster, like, I'll do what you said, I'll go to Nineveh. Right, and in the New Testament, we see Jesus Christ pray, If it is possible, let this chalice pass from me, Matthew 26, 19. But what does the scripture say elsewhere? For this reason, you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor let your Holy One see corruption. Psalm 1610, it was the will of the Lord to see Christ crucified, for that is the only way by which we can atone for sin and death and be uh, joined to the Father in perfect communion and be free from the bondage of sin and death. And the body of Christ did not see corruption, for he arose victorious over sin and death on the third day. Most assuredly, it is impossible for him who is life by nature to be defeated by death. And returning to Jonah, he is strengthened in his face, in his faith, and he is released from the belly of the sea monster and cast up on dry land. We see in chapter three, he is reminded by the word of the Lord who comes to him that he has to that he is going to go to Nineveh like God originally told him and he agreed to do if he was released from the sea monster and preach to them of their repenting destruction. It is a somewhat long journey. It takes three days from the time Nineveh is released from the belly of the sea monster till he reaches Nineveh. But look what happens when Jonah goes to Nineveh. He tells them that they're going to be destroyed. And what does Nineveh do? They repent and not only do they turn to God in fasting but prayer, but even the king does this. But look what Israel did when Christ came. They rejected the Messiah. So Christ remarks that he was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I mean, actually, this is a reference to Ezekiel 3, 4 to 7, where the father is commanding the son of man, Christ, to go to the house of Israel first. Uh, the furthermore, the very same gospel and message given to Israel was given to the Gentiles. Indeed, the early church was comprised of Hebrews and God-fearers alike, that is, the pagans who abandoned poly polytheism to worship the God of Israel. And not only that, but Israel sincerely fasted and prayed. They fasted in a way that is pleasing to God because they turned from their evil ways and from the iniquity in their actions. They fasted from sin. They, their fasting was a living work. And this is the thing. When we fast properly, it's a living work and it glorifies God, and this is what the people of Nineveh did. And thus the Lord does not say to them, this was not the fast thing I wanted. Instead, the Lord relents and spares Nineveh for their repentance. And this brings us to chapter 4. So when it turns out that God chooses to spare Nineveh and not bring about the destruction he foretold to Jonah, Jonah gets saddened. And, uh, 
the Lord teaches Jonah a valuable lesson in this. So Jonah is sitting and resting on a hill, and the heat of the sun is great, and God gives him a pumpkin vine to provide shade. Jonah is pleased with it, but he gets distressed and upset when God takes it away from him, and he feels the heat of the sun once more. And this is what the Lord God Almighty says to Jonah. You showed concern for the pumpkin plant which you did not labor and which you did not grow, which came into being by night and perished by night. Should I, on the other hand, show no concern for Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and many animals? Jonah 4, 10-11, St. Cyril. So, Nineveh is a great city, as we said before. It is the capital of the Assyrian Empire. It is, in particular, in the land of the Persians, uh, in, for the geographic parameters of regions that St. Cyril uses and was used at the time. Uh, Nineveh has thousands upon thousands of people and animals and the like, right? We're not giving uh, an exact number for the population of Nineveh. We're just told 120,000, but it could be more of that when you include women and children. The point is this is a very number, large number, but think about all the people this represents. Like, I mean, maybe it could be 200,000 or more. We're not sure. It's not revealed to us in the scriptures. But the important part is that the Lord has compassion on them because they sincerely repented and turned to the Lord. And lo, Christ saved everyone, giving himself as a ransom for all, Jew and Gentile alike. Psalm 36, 6 to 7. Lord, you will save human beings and animals alike, as you made your mercy abound. O God, all people will hope in the shelter of your wings. Lo, Christ is God, and he has saved us. And so, I want to end with the following point. While God did not destroy Nineveh at the time of Jonah, the people of Nineveh returned to their pagan ways within two to three generations, and the prophet Nahum foretold their destruction, Nineveh itself fell in 612 BC, and so Nineveh was eventually destroyed, as we see from the book of Nahum and the prophecy of the prophet Nahum. Nineveh is eventually destroyed. Jonah is originally sent to foretell the impending destruction of Nineveh, and they initially repent and turn to the Lord. But remember what we were talking about in Joel chapter 2, when hardship and calamity happen, in joy and happiness, no matter the case, no matter the lot, or the calling and onus is on us to worship the Lord God Almighty thick and through at all times, right? I mean, for whatever reason, it's not told to us in the book of Jonah, but by the time Nahum is writing his prophetic book, the people of Nineveh had uh, turned away from God and went back to their pagan ways. And lo, when you reject the Lord God Almighty, you're, that turns to doom and destruction. And so, the important thing to keep in mind in the book of Jonah is that the Lord is merciful and full of loving kindness and compassion. As we see, when we sincerely turn to the Lord in prayer and repentance and fasting, he will have mercy and compassion on us. We have been redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. We serve the triune God who is revealed to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May we continue to serve and worship the Holy Spirit, both in times of joy and happiness, and in times of calamity and hardship and danger, or whatever else may befall us in the throngs of life. May we always turn to the Lord with joy and compassion in our hearts and worship the Lord for as long as he lives, enduring this race until the end. Until next time, guys, God bless and have a great day. Thank you for the support and watching my videos.